Hello, everyone, and welcome to this presentation of Walking in Their Footsteps, Locating Places Where Our Ancestors Lived and Worked, sponsored by the City of Clearwater's Aging Well Center. If you've researched your family history or know some of your family's background, you may already know many of the towns, cities, and areas where your ancestors lived and worked. But how many of you have tracked down the exact location of the homes and businesses? In this presentation, we'll look at some of the different types of records that you can use to track down those exact locations. The ones that we'll be looking at in this presentation are directories, vital records, other types of government records, travel records, newspapers, maps, and family papers. Needless to say, these are not all of the types of records that are available that might give you clues to an address, but these are some of the more common ones and ones that are easier to start with. During this presentation, I'll go into more detail on each one of these categories and show you examples of each. Let's start with directories. City directories have been around for a very long time and can be very helpful to give you addresses and even some additional information, which I'll show you in a moment. Telephone directories became common once most households had telephones. These two types of directories can often be found online, although some of them you may have to contact the public library or the historical society near the location of where your ancestors lived and worked. Was your ancestor a member of a profession? such as a doctor, a lawyer, or a minister. Many of these people were part of large professional organizations, and some of these organizations put out directories. If you go online and do a search for the name of that organization, you may be able to find those directories. Maybe they were part of other types of organizations, such as a fraternal order or a social club. It's possible that those individual organizations may also have put out directories of their members. Was your ancestor in the military or were they a civilian worker connected to the military? In the 1900s in particular, there were directories put out listing those who were in service or connected to service. Again, if you go online, try doing some searches to see if you can track down your ancestor in one of these directories. This is an example of a city directory from 1920 for Washington, D.C. My grandfather, as a young 20 year old, decided to go to Washington for about a year or so to find work in the post-World War I era when there were a lot of new government jobs available. If you look in the directory alphabetically by the last name, and then within that group, look alphabetically by the first name, you may be able to find your ancestor in whichever directories they may have appeared in. In this example, my grandfather, Raymond, can be found in Washington, D.C. in this 1920 city directory. It tells me that not only was he living there, it tells me his occupation. He was a typist. It even tells me where he was working. He was at the War Risk Department, which was a government department set up in order to handle insurance claims as part of the war. 
it tells me that he was renting at 1736 G Street Northwest. It's common in these city directories that they shorten the entry as much as possible. So if you don't see what type of street, such as street, avenue, place, then if that's left out, by default, it usually is street. If it's another one, such as avenue, it will usually include that in the address. When I look at that particular address on a map, I get a whole new perspective of what it must have been like when he was living there. Although the apartment building that he lived in is long gone, and it's now large office buildings in that area, I know from the address that it had to be located somewhere on this block, which as you can see, was right across the street from the White House. Another type of record, which is commonly available, which may give you location information, are what are called vital records. These are birth, marriage, and death records, and you can also include divorce records. Often, these types of records are already in your own family history collection. Go ahead and take a look and see what kind of information you might be able to find. For example, in this 1919 marriage license, you can see that the address for both the bride and the groom were given at the time that they applied for the license. Of course, always keep in mind with these types of records that how much information you get all depends on the time period and the location of the record. Sometimes it may only have the city and sometimes it won't ask this type of question at all. This is an example of a 1906 death record. On it, it asks for the place of death and residence. For both, it was in the city of Boston. The place of death is given as Franklin Park, and the family was living at 47 School Street. Unfortunately, on this particular day, little eight-year-old Edwin accidentally drowned in the park while he was playing near the pond. Whenever you look at a record, always look to see if there's any other location information available. For example, toward the bottom, you can see that the place of burial was Sandwich, Massachusetts, rather than Boston. And you may wonder why Edwin was taken to another town to be buried. But as you can see here in the middle of the record, his father, Charles, was born in Sandwich. The parents took little Edwin to the cemetery to be buried with the other family members. A few years ago, I had the opportunity to visit the cemetery. And I took this picture. The large headstone that you see toward the front is a joint monument for multiple family members who are buried in the adjoining plots. And right behind them is the marker for little Edwin. When you look at a map, once again, you can see more information about this story. Toward the top of the screen, you can see the red place mark, which is located where the family was living at 47 School Street. This was just about a block or so from the edge of the park, and it's likely that Edward and his siblings played in the park on a regular basis. And you can also see where the pond was located where he drowned that day. There are many other types of government records that your ancestors likely appeared in. <laughs> 
and some of those may also have location information. For example, different types of court records. Maybe one of your ancestors had to take someone to court, or maybe they had to go to court in order to pay a fine. They may have served as a witness in a trial or even a member of the jury. In those records, they may have needed to provide their address. If your ancestor owned property, chances are good that you can locate land records such as deeds. And of course, a deed will give some information to help you locate the exact spot where that property was located. You may be able to find information in probate records, particularly if an ancestor was leaving property to his heirs. It may have needed to provide information specifying where that property was located. Your ancestors likely appeared in tax records, particularly if they owned property. And it may give you information of where that place was located. Did your ancestor serve in the military? If so, you may be able to find addresses in those records as well. Try to track down their military service records. It may provide the address of where they lived or possibly where their military pay was being sent while they were in service. If they were in the draft registration records for World War I or World War II, such as the example shown here on the screen, it will usually give their address and sometimes the address of their next of kin or their employer. If your ancestor received a pension from the military, an address may be in the information because the government needed to know where to send the money. Location information may also appear in some of the census records that were taken in the United States every 10 years. This is an example of a land deed from 1867 from Massachusetts. Although it doesn't give the address of the home and land that was being purchased in this deed, it does provide enough information to define exactly where that home was located. Using this type of record and other resources such as maps, I was able to place this particular home of my great grandfather. And when I was able to visit a few years ago, I walked past the house and took this picture. The census records in the United States since 1880 have provided the name of the street for the people who are being enumerated in the census. For example, here in this 1940 page from the Pawtucket, Rhode Island census, it shows these households were living on John Street. The next column over was the house number. So I can identify Romeo Fortin and his family living at 55 John Street. You might also find address information about your ancestors in travel records. For example, starting in the first few decades of the 1900s, ship's passenger lists may have recorded the address for U.S. citizens traveling abroad, or if they were immigrant ancestors coming to the United States, they may have included the address of the person in the U.S. that they were coming to join. If they became a naturalized citizen of the U.S., you may find their address in their naturalization records, depending on the time period. If they traveled across the border to a neighboring country, such as Canada, 
you may be able to find a record of that passage. Or if they traveled abroad, you may find a passport or visa. This is an example of a Canadian border crossing record. This is a record for Romeo Fortin, whom we met just a moment ago on the census record. In 1925, he took a train to Canada. And as you can see, he was living at 55 John Street even back then. It also provides the information of who he was going to visit with, his uncle, Napoleon Bessette in Montreal. It lists the street as St. Jerome, but it doesn't have a house number. However, with a city and a street and a name, I could probably use some additional records to track down the exact address. Newspapers are a great way to find information about your ancestors, particularly if they lived in a small or medium-sized town. People were talked about in the newspapers much more often in the past than they are today. I tend to think of newspapers as the Facebook of their day. Quite often, towns had a society column, which talked about all of the information that was going on in town, such as who was having dinner with whom, who was traveling out of town or had visitors, and who was in the hospital. You can frequently find your ancestors mentioned in these columns. Maybe something more interesting happened to them and they had an entire article written about them. For example, in one newspaper from the 1920s, I found an article written about an ancestor who was injured after a horse stepped on his foot. You may find address information in obituaries and funeral notices that appeared in the newspapers. And often your ancestors would appear in public notices. For example, when an ancestor passed away, frequently the executor of the estate was required to put a public notice in the newspaper in case there were any outstanding debts. And of course, it would have an address to let the people know who they were talking about. You may also find them in classified ads if one of your ancestors was selling something. I once found a classified ad that a relative had placed in the newspaper because he had found a lost dog and he wanted to let the owner know where he could find him. You may also find information in advertisements particularly for a business that your ancestor owned or one that they worked for. This is an example of an obituary in which it lists the address of the deceased. This happened to be one of my great grandfathers and I was able to go by the house some years ago and took this picture showing that the house was still there. A moment ago, I mentioned the society column. To my surprise, I found that one of my second great grandmothers was a society editor for one of those columns in her small weekly newspaper for several years back in the early 1900s. These people often didn't go through town asking for information. Instead, they would have people drop off or send them the information. So in her column, she mentions her address, number 82 North Broad Street in Johnson City, New York, and asks people to send her information to be put in the column. I found an old photo of the house. Unfortunately, it's no longer standing because it was torn down back in the 1970s for a freeway overpass. As you can probably tell by now, maps are very important to the process of tracking down the exact location where your ancestors lived and worked. There are a number of different types of maps that can be helpful, such as 
town and city maps. If your ancestor was a farmer and had a large amount of land, they may appear on county maps. Fire insurance maps were created in order to get extremely detailed city maps that you can easily find online. Plat maps and various other types of maps may also prove helpful. This is an example of an 1873 map from Corning, New York. This is where my mother grew up. And she often talked about a lot of her childhood was spent at a house at number nine Jennings Street. On this map, you can see Jennings Street. It's not very big, so I should have an easy way to track down what that house was. She told me it was near the school, which you can see here on the map. But the house was close to the intersection of Jennings Street and Bridge Street. You can see here in 1873, those two streets had not been extended yet and didn't intersect. However, a little bit later, this 1898 map shows that those streets were extended and had joined. Here's the school that I showed you just a moment ago. And using various other sources, I was able to determine that this was the house that my mother was referring to. Although on this map in 1898, it was listed as number six, Jennings Street. Some years ago, I was able to drive by and was able to take a picture of the house, which currently is number nine. The last category that we'll talk about today is family papers. Often families accumulate documents and other items that have the potential to include addresses or other location information. For example, postcards and letters, especially if you have the envelope in which the letter was sent. These would have to include an address so that they could get delivered. Diaries and journals kept by a family member may include an address or location information. Photographs may include a house number or show neighboring buildings, which can help you to pin down exactly where that picture was taken. Funeral cards may have the address of the deceased, but you can also find the addresses for the funeral home and the cemetery. And those businesses may have additional records about that person. Notes and receipts may have addresses included on them and various other types of documents that your family may have held on to. These are a few examples from my own family collection. For each of these locations, I've managed to work out whether the building still exists and what the address is today. For example, this is an advertisement that my second great grandfather created to announce the fact that he was starting a grocery store in his home in 1901. At that point, the house was 14 Jennings Street. However, today, it's number 29. This is the envelope from a letter that was sent to Maynard's son, Clifton, my great-grandfather, in 1915. At the time this letter was sent, the house was number 31 Jennings Street. Today, that address is number 33. This is a driver's license for my grandfather in 1937 at 179 Bridge Street in Corning. Unfortunately, that address no longer exists and the building is now a parking lot. 
And this is a rent receipt kept by one of my ancestors in 1890. It was only $8 for the monthly rental of the house at number nine Jennings Street. However, this isn't the current number nine Jennings Street that I showed you a moment ago. Instead, in 1890, what was number nine is now number 18. And it's across the street and about two houses down. My second great grandfather, who started the grocery store in his home, did so well that he had several other businesses later in life. This photo shows the last one. It was a furniture store that he started in the 1920s. Although this was a brightly lit photo, so it's hard to see, but standing in front of the truck is my second great grandfather. On the side of his delivery truck, he advertised for the business, and he put the address as 62 to 68 Bridge Street, and the delivery truck is parked in front of that building. I looked on Google Maps to see what 62 Bridge Street was today and if it still existed, and I did find a 62 Bridge Street. When I visited that location, I saw that it was indeed still the same building as it was back in the 1920s. This example is for an even earlier ancestor. Not long before the Revolutionary War, one of my ancestors moved from Cape Cod, Massachusetts to South Hold on the North Fork of Long Island, New York. He bought a house for what is today 450 Young's Avenue. When I visited that area, I was able to walk by that house and take a picture showing that it still exists today. I believe that one of the reasons he picked this particular house is because he was the captain of a small boat that went between Long Island and Boston, Massachusetts, delivering and picking up goods. If you walk just a little bit down that street, you see an inlet that had docks available for him to pull up his boat. After taking a picture of the house, I walked down that street and found that even today, there are still docks where boats can pull up. While I was on Long Island, I also visited Southampton and the South Fork of Long Island. And I visited the Historical Museum because I had ancestors who lived there as well. When I visited the museum, I found on the wall a large map had been drawn showing the early town lots and the property owners for those lots from 1648 to 1878. When I looked closer at this section of the map, I found that I had several different ancestors who were all living next door to each other. In fact, this largest lot of land in town for Thomas Halsey shows that he originally bought the land in 1648, and that's when he started building his first house. He is also one of my ancestors, and I was lucky enough to discover that that house still exists today. It's been turned into a property for the Historical Museum, and I was able to take tour through the house and quite literally walk in my ancestors' footsteps. So your assignment, if you're able to, track down some of the locations where your ancestors lived and worked, and plan a visit. Even if you can't go in the house, or if that building no longer exists, just walking down the street, just as your ancestor would have, 
back in the past can bring a whole new perspective to that ancestor's life. On behalf of myself and the Clearwater Aging Well Center, thank you so much for joining me for this presentation.